to day episode date fact sponsored by fire hello me croc you like eating cooked food or not freezing to death in cold well me have invention for you it only take uh, this many step first collect stick and put on ground next collect pair of pointy stone finally place all in big pile and move to ceremonial offering plinth with any luck Cloud will fall, and offering will tempt dragon that live in sky to give spiky fire. If dragon no give fire, may need to sweeten deal by offering sacrifice. Crook suggest old goat or old man, depend which less expensive. That all for today. For further details, message at crook at rock dot rock. The tone on crook that crook sound like Bolo from Mighty Bush. Hey look, it's oxygen, that element that keeps everything on the planet alive and stops our lungs from decompressing into squishy pink crisp packets. By mass, oxygen is the third most common element in the universe, and the most common element full stop on Earth. Under standard conditions, oxygen atoms like to bond with each other with an oxygen-oxygen double bond. The compound that forms from this is a colourless, odourless gas called, well, oxygen gas or O2, or dioxygen if you want to be really posh about it. People can survive for days without water and for weeks without food, and potentially even longer if you're overweight or a cactus in a very convincing wig. But if you go more than a few minutes without oxygen, all you'll be fit for is compost material and impromptu Halloween decorations. This is because oxygen is a vital component in aerobic respiration, the process that lets animals convert food into energy. The proper chemistry behind aerobic respiration goes a bit further down biochemistry avenue than I'm comfortable with for one video, so we're going to be pairing this back to the bare basics. So life scientists, please avert your eyes because I'm about to trample over the nuances of your subject like a centipede in footy boots. The main components of aerobic respiration are oxygen gas and glucose, a simple sugar which, as you can see, is also partly made out of oxygen. Humans take in these substances from our environment. We get oxygen from the air and glucose from the food that we eat. The grossly oversimplified formula for aerobic respiration we get taught in secondary school is oxygen plus glucose makes carbon dioxide, water and energy. The unsimplified version, meanwhile, is a nightmarishly complicated series of chemical reactions, the sheer scale of which seems almost purposely designed to break the spirit of A-level biology students. The energy produced from aerobic respiration powers every chemical process in our body, functions like keeping our hearts pumping and our brains thinking and our pancreases, uh, pancreasin. As explained before, there's about a dictionary's worth of fine detail I've rather unceremoniously skipped, like how does glucose get to our cells in the first place? How is energy from respiration stored, and how do we control it? And what's this powerhouse of the cell I've heard so much about? I've left links to more comprehensive materials in the description, but for now we can leave it at this. Oxygen goes in, CO2, water and energy comes out, and urine, and sweat and sometimes babies if you're heavily pregnant or in possession of a uterus in ancient Greece. Oxygen's discovery sprouted from one of the most fundamental questions in science. Why do things catch fire? In the 18th century, the prevailing theory was that flammable substances like plants and paper and school children contained the gaseous fire-like elements called phlogiston, often represented with the Greek letter pi. When these substances were raised to a point of combustion, fire was just the release of phlogiston escaping into the environment. Unfortunately, the foundation of a good scientific theory is plenty of experimental evidence, and the real world was throwing up a few awkward questions that phlogiston theory couldn't explain. For instance, take a strip of magnesium wire in a closed container, then heat it up with a Bunsen burner. Once it's exposed to oxygen in the air, it'll produce a brilliant white flame, which will then die down to leave a colourless chalky powder. According to phlogiston theory, that white flame is phlogiston being removed from the metal, which is then reabsorbed by the air when you take it out of the container. But if you weigh the product of this reaction and compare it to the amount of magnesium you started with, you'll find that it's actually slightly heavier. So what happened there? Shouldn't the ashes weigh less now the phlogiston's been removed? Did the magnesium get sad after losing its mate and turn to binge eating cakes as a coping mechanism? Defenders of phlogiston theory came up with some really weird explanation for this. The idea of phlogiston having negative mass was a particular favourite of mine. But fact is, the theory wasn't holding water. We now know combustion is a broad class of chemical reactions, usually between a flammable object and an oxygen source. Fire isn't an element in and of itself, but a superheated, shapeless plasma, usually made out of oxygen, water vapour and fuel. This is why magnesium gets heavier when you set it on fire. The atoms in the magnesium powder are reacting with molecules of oxygen gas in the air to make magnesium oxide, which is the white powder I talked about earlier. This is heavier than this, so your theory checks out. Hooray, tea and biscuits for all. Oxygen was discovered in the 1770s, but scientific historians have yet to make up their mind as to who was the first. At various points in history, oxygen's discovery has been attributed to three men. Antoine Lavoisier from Paris, France, Carl William Scheele from Stralsund, Germany, or Stralsund, Swedish Pomerania as it was back then, 
and Joseph Priestley for embarrassed in God's green country of Yorkshire. Priestley published his findings in 1776, and he isolated oxygen through his experiments with mercury oxide, a poisonous orange powder that decomposes to mercury and oxygen gas on heating. Like many intellectuals of his time, Priestley was a staunch defender of phlogiston theory, and when he noticed that substances were more flammable in oxygen than they were in regular air, he theorised this was because the new gas was dephlogisticated. Priestley hypothesised that oxygen was simply air with phlogiston removed from it. As such, when burning substances released their phlogiston, the oxygen would be able to absorb more of it, hence the more vigorous flames. Scheele, meanwhile, wouldn't publish his results until 1777, but came to largely the same conclusions as Priestley. Scheele was also a believer in phlogiston theory, or the phlogpodge, if you will, and he christened the new gas Feuerluft, or fire air in German. Now, Priestley and Scheele were both precociously gifted men, but I speak no hyperbole when I say Antoine Lavoisier was to chemistry what Charles Darwin was to biology. A thinker of such profound brilliance, his ideas would shape an entire field of study for centuries to come. Lavoisier has often been called the father of modern chemistry, and I could honestly spend an entire video gushing about his achievements like a garden hose with the trots. Lavoisier discovered oxygen independently of Priestley and Scheele in 1778, but correctly identified that it, not phlogiston, was responsible for combustion. Lavoisier named the new element oxygen, or acid former, after correctly noticing that non-metals like sulphur and phosphorus formed acids when burnt in an oxygen-rich environment, and also incorrectly hypothesising that only compounds containing oxygen were acidic, as many a mobster dissolved in hydrofluoric acid to be happy to disprove. So who discovered oxygen first? Well, going by publication data, it'd be Priestley, but there's evidence to suggest that Scheele conducted his experiments up to two years before he went to the press, which would make him the true discoverer. But Priestley was the first to publish, and Lavoisier was the first to get it right about oxygen's true chemistry, so who knows? Maybe we can stretch out the throne three ways like a chaise long or one of those three-seater bicycles from the goodies. While O2 is far and away the most stable form of purified oxygen, another common form on Earth is ozone, or O3. Under standard conditions, ozone is a faint blue gas with a sharp, clean smell. It's sort of like... Do you know how rain kind of has a smell? Okay, stop looking at me like that, you know what I mean. If you've ever thought that air tastes or smells cleaner or fresher after a drizzly day, particularly if you live in the city, ozone formation in the atmosphere is one of the reasons why. At sea level, though, the amount of ozone in the air is close to zero, and thank God for that. Concentrated ozone is enormously toxic and can cause irreversible damage to your lungs and throat if you're stupid enough to breathe it in. The highest concentrations of ozone in air are found in a section of the stratosphere, known fittingly enough as the ozone layer. But in 1985, a team of climate scientists an Antarctic research station made the discovery that shook the world to its very foundations. Ozone is constantly being produced and destroyed in the stratosphere thanks to ultraviolet radiation emitted by the sun. Unfortunately, humanity had swamped the atmosphere with pollutants known as chlorofluorocarbons to chemists and CFCs to everyone else. The funny thing is, on the Earth's surface, chlorofluorocarbons are pretty boring. At room temperature, most CFCs are colourless inert gases and are often used in aerosol products like deodorants and hairsprays. But when CFCs escape into the upper atmosphere, the UV radiation from the sun rips their bonds apart, creating, amongst other things, unpaired chlorine atoms, often called chlorine radicals. If left in the air, chlorine radicals will catalyse the conversion of ozone into oxygen gas, decimating the natural balance of the stratosphere. Science had known about the ozone layer getting thinner since the 70s, but the levels over the South Pole were far lower than anticipated. Had the rate of ozone depletion in the Antarctic carried over to the rest of the world, the knock-on effects would have been nothing short of apocalyptic. Without a protective layer of ozone, levels of UV radiation at the Earth's surface would skyrocket, sharply increasing rates of skin cancer and immunodeficiency disorders. Across the globe, crops would wither and die from radiation-induced deformities, leading to mass starvation and a global collapse of the agricultural industry. The oceans, which are some of the biggest sinks for the sun's energy, would become little more than irradiated graveyards, condemning scores of aquatic species to extinction. A world without ozone wouldn't be a world at all. In its place would be an uninhabitable wasteland, ravaged by famine, economic and societal collapse, and death. Now, in the interest of making this video less suicidally bleak, I'd like to wrap things up on a high note to keep things nice and cheery. In January 1989, the Montreal Protocol was brought into force, strictly regulating the sale and production of CFCs. Since then, the ozone layer has begun to gradually repair itself, and if current trends are continued, we're on course to see it fully replenished, give or take half a century or so. To date, every nation in the world has ratified the terms of the Montreal Protocol making it one of the most successful agreements of its kind in human history. They even got Vatican City to sign, which can I just say is adorable. What, did the senior cardinals have a whip round the office and buy the Pope a new fridge? Now, the Montreal Protocol was a step in the right direction, but there's still about 499 steps left to go to reverse the effects of man-made climate change before it's too late. And the sooner the developed world puts its big boy pants on and tackles the problem aggressively, the better. But in this one specific case of one specific part of the problem, humanity actually did a pretty good job. Well done. Now let's keep the momentum going and talk about regulating the fossil fuel industry. Right, guys? Guys? Ugh.